Hello. In this tutorial, we're going to learn how to use Code.org's App Lab to create a space shooter style game. I'm going to demonstrate how this works. We're going to hit start. Our timer will start counting up. We hit enter to fire a shot. The enemies will speed up and then they will move back and forth across the screen to make them harder to hit. In this case, we've set it up in such a way that their speed will change as they move left and right across the screen. Once we destroy all the enemies, the timer will stop. Our goal is to destroy all enemies in the shortest amount of time. So I'm on my code.org projects page. I'm going to create a new project, an App Lab project. Now I'm going to rename it so it's easy to find. I'm going to hit rename. I'm going to call it Space Shooter. And then I'm going to hit save so it saves the name. The graphics I'm going to use are from an artist called Morgan 3D. I downloaded them from opengameart.org. If you'd like more information on how to find good game art on the web, click on the video link in the upper right hand corner of this screen. I'm going to go back to my Space Shooter game. Now I'm going to drag an image here. This is going to be my ship. I'm going to change the ID to image underscore ship. This is a good naming convention for App Lab where I have the object type and then underscore then the name of the object. Now I'm going to go to image, choose. I'm going to upload a file. Now I've already cut out the ships I want to use. This was the original file I downloaded that has multiple kinds of ships on it. It's important when you cut them out or crop them that you have as little white border as possible. Because even though you won't be able to see that white border on a background, that will be involved in collision checking. So I'm going to select Hero Ship. I'm going to select Choose. Now you see this has a white border when I imported it, even though it didn't from the original image. And that's because we're trying to force a rectangular image into a square size. So I'm going to have to resize it and make sure I get rid of the right white border. So I'm going to click and drag, make it a little smaller, and you see now the white border is gone because I've got it in its original rectangular shape. Next, I'm going to create an enemy. So I'm going to drag image. I'm going to call this one image underscore enemy underscore one. I'm going to choose the image. I'm going to upload another file. I'm going to choose one of these ships. I'm going to select choose. Now this is way too big for what I want. The smaller we make these ships, the harder they'll be to hit. So we're going to resize it both so it's smaller and there's no white border on the top and the bottom. And there we go. That looks like a good size. Now I'm going to duplicate it. So I select it again. I duplicate it. And I'm going to change this name to image underscore enemy underscore two. Duplicate it again, image underscore enemy underscore three. Duplicate it a final time, image underscore enemy underscore four. And you can make as many or as few of these as you want. Now I'm going to move them around. I'm going to click, you see the little hand icon. I want to make sure these are all lined up on the x-axis because I'm going to have them be moving in sync. So we see... Let's see, this one is at an x value of 210. This one, we'll move it to an x value of 210, move it down a little bit. This one, we'll move it about here and get the x value to 210. And finally, this one, we'll put right about there and get the x value to 210. So they're all lined up on the x-axis. Next, I want to create something for my ammo. We want to make the object we're going to be shooting out small, again, to make it challenging to hit the things. If it's too big, it'll hit them even accidentally. So I'm going to make another image. We'll put it right in front of the ship. In this case, I just created a 10 by 10 pixel image in paint. It's something you can do very simply. Uh, so I'm going to call this image underscore energy, because it's going to be an energy bolt. I'm going to select choose. I'm going to upload a file. This is my fireball. Open it. Choose. So this is way too big. Again, it by default forces it into 100 by 100. So I'm just going to change this one manually to a 10 by 10. 
Sometimes if you try to make it too small, you can't really do it by clicking and dragging the size. So you have to manually select it and then go in and change the width and the height. So if we wanted to make these ships really small, you know, I could only make it so small by clicking and dragging. But then if I wanted to make it even smaller than that, I could make it like a 10 by 10. But I'm going to put this back to a 30 by 40, and there it's back to the original size. So I've got my ammo. In this case, it's a little hard to click and drag it because it's so small to another location. So I'm just going to click on it to select it, and then I can change the X and Y position manually. So let's make it a little further over and a little further down. It doesn't really matter where this starts out at. There we go. The final thing we need to do is create a button. That's going to start the program. So we're going to drag the button there. We're going to call it button underscore start. And the text is going to be under text start. And I'm going to change the color. I'm going to give it a blue background. And there we go. And we can move this around, click and drag it wherever we want. So now we've set up all the objects in the interface we need. And now we're going to go start looking at the code. Our next step is we're going to create controls to move the player ship up and down. So we're going to start by changing the name of the screen. So we clicked on the screen. Right now it's screen 1. I'm going to change it to screen underscore game. Now we have to write some code. So we're going to go to code. And then we're going to go to UI controls and we're going to grab an on event block. Now you can see it's drag and drop, but we are working in the text mode. We can always switch back and forth. Even when we're working in text mode, sometimes it's easier to drag things in and let it convert it to text. Okay, so the on event we want is we want when screen game, so this means it's going to have to be in screen game, the event we're looking for is key down. So that means any key is pressed. And then we have this anonymous function here. Anonymous function is a function without any name. And this anonymous function runs every time there is a key down when we're in the screen game. So next what we have to do is we have to get the current location of the ship on the X and Y axis. Now the location it takes is the upper left hand corner of the image. So right about there, that's the location it's going to be dealing with. We're going to declare a local variable. So we're going to say var. This is a local variable since it's declared inside a function. It'll only exist inside each run of this function. We're going to call it ship x, and we're going to set it equal to get x position, which is a function that's built into App Lab. And we want to, the x position, we want to get it from the ID of this ship. The ID of this ship here is image underscore ship. It's important to put it in quotation marks since this is a literal string. So we're going to have a semicolon there. We're going to say var ship y. We're going to say equals get y position. And same thing in quotation marks image underscore ship. So now we've got the current x and y location of the ship where it sits right now. So now what we have to do is we have to decide how far we're going to move it. So I'm going to create another local variable. I'm going to call it var distance. And I'm going to set it equal to 12. Now we can change this if we want. For now, we're going to go with 12. If you want it to be more or less, that's fine. Now we have to check which button is being pressed. Because this anonymous function will be activated anytime any key is pressed. So we'll start by checking if the up arrow key is pressed. And we do that by creating an if, then parentheses. We say event dot key double equals, then a string literal up with a capital U. Now if this Boolean expression evaluates to true, we're going to do whatever's inside these curly brackets here. And all we want to do is we want to change the Y value. We want to decrease it by the amount of distance. So we're going to say ship Y equals ship Y minus distance. Now the reason we're subtracting is on a computer screen, the upper left-hand corner is 0, 0. And the Y increases as we go down, 
and the x increases as we go to the right. So as this ship moves up, its y value is actually decreasing. We're going to do something similar with the down. We're going to say if event dot key equals down. We're going to say ship y equals ship y plus distance. What this does is it takes the old value in the ship y variable, adds whatever's in the distance variable, in this case 12, and that becomes the new value inside the ship y variable. Sometimes it's easier to think of a single equals sign as like a left pointing arrow. So this here on the right hand side is calculated and that data goes into the variable on the left hand side. Now we've got the new y value calculated. So we actually have to set the image at this new location. The x is going to be the same, we just had to take it so we can send it back. We're going to use a function called set position. This is another function that's built into App Lab. Now you see App Lab's helping us out. It's telling us what arguments it needs. So it's saying it needs the ID, the new x value, the new y value, the width and the height. We can actually use this just by sending the ID and the x and the y, and we're going to do that because we don't want to change the width and the height. So the ID is the string literal image underscore ship and since it's a string literal we have it in quotation marks so we'll say image underscore ship then we have a comma and it tells us it's waiting for our argument for the x so we're going to say ship x which isn't going to be a change because the ship never moves on the x-axis and then we're going to say the final one which is ship y so we'll send the updated y value to set position so it'll move the ship we'll end this line with a semicolon and let's try running it and see if it works. So we're going to hit run. We're going to move it up. We're going to move it down. So our ship moves. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to create a function that can wrap an object around to the other side of the screen when it's halfway off the bottom or halfway off the top. We're going to make a function that we can use either on our ship or on any of the enemies. We're going to hit F11 to make this full screen to get a little more workspace here. So now I'm going to go, I'm going to make a function. I'm going to call it vertical wrap around. And then I'm going to put a parameter called object. And this parameter is going to take in a value that's going to be the ID for whatever object we want to wrap around. By the way, if you want a wrap around function that will work either vertically or horizontally, check the link in the upper right hand corner of the screen and it'll explain how to do that. So we are going to create some curly brackets. And we're going to declare a local variable. We'll call it object x because it'll be the x value of whatever object ID is in that object variable. We'll say equals get x position and then we'll put the argument object. Now the reason we aren't putting this in quotation marks is we don't want literally the word object. We want whatever string is inside object. So if we're dealing with a string literal, we put quotation marks around it. If we're dealing with a variable that holds a string literal or another type of data, then we don't put quotation marks around it. Next, we're gonna create a local variable object y and we'll set it equal to get y position. And we'll get the y position of whatever object ID is in the variable object. The next thing we need to do is we need to get the height of our ship. And the reason for that is, is we want to make sure it's halfway off the screen, either on the top or the bottom, before we wrap it up. And we need to know the height of the object to calculate whether it's halfway off the screen. So we're going to declare a local variable called object height. And we're going to get the height by using the get property function. Now we can get all sorts of properties with the get property function. If you want to see some examples, just click on see examples there. The ID of the object we're dealing with will be in the variable object. And then the property we want is height. And we will put this in quotation marks. We'll hit a semicolon to end that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to check it to see if the ship or any other object is halfway off the screen on the top edge. So we'll say if object y, which is the 
y value of whatever objects we're dealing with. Then we'll say less than 0 minus object height divided by 2. So if it's halfway off the screen, its y value is actually going to be less than 0 because its origin is going to be right about there. If that's the case, we are going to set object y equal to 450 minus object height divided by 2. And what that does is that will move it back around the other side. This is 450 on the y-axis there. And we only want it halfway off, so we want the origin to be half of the height minus 450. So it'll actually put it right about there if we're dealing with this ship. Now we're going to do an LSIF. What an LSIF does is it only checks the Boolean expression if the if previous to it or the else if previous to it is false. So if this is true, we don't even have to check the else if because it can't be on the top edge and the bottom edge at the same time. So we're going to say else if object y is greater than 450 minus object height divided by 2. So it's going to check to see if it's going off the bottom edge. And if it is, if it is, we're going to set the variable object y equal to 0 minus object height divided by 2. So we've calculated what the new object y should be. However, we actually have to write the code to send whatever object it is to that new y value. So we're going to use the command set position. We're going to pass the ID of whatever is in the object parameter. We're going to send object X, which will be unchanged from this function. And we're going to send object Y, which will potentially be changed from this function if either this or this were true. Now this function is not going to get called automatically. We want this function to be called whenever the key down is pressed. So we're going to go to the end of this anonymous function and we're going to call vertical wrap around and in this case we want to send the ID for the ship so it's going to say image underscore ship and we'll have a semicolon to end that line let's run it and see if it works so we'll say run we can move it up and it moves to the bottom part of the screen and it will move down and it moves back up to the top part of the screen and we're going to use the same function later to have all our enemies wrap around when they hit the top or the bottom too. Next, we're going to create some global variables. Global variables are different than local variables in several ways. First, global variables are declared outside of any function. This gives them the advantage of lasting the whole lifetime of the program and they are accessible from every function in the program. I'm going to, my first one I'm going to create is called gunloaded and we'll start off by setting this true. We can only fire one bullet at a time, and we can only fire if the value of gun loaded is true. Next, we're going to create a variable, enemies moving left. All our enemies will be moving in the same direction. We'll start off with a false value. When they are moving left, this will be true. Next, we're going to create a variable, game started, and we'll set that equal to false. It'll become true once the game is started. Next, we're going to create a variable called enemies remaining. This is going to have a number value that's 4. If you have more or less enemies, you'll start it out as whatever number of enemies you have on your screen. Next, we're going to create a variable called start time. This is going to allow us to keep track of the start time so we can calculate the current time. We're not going to initialize this. And finally, we're going to create a variable called elapsed time. And this is going to keep track of how much time has passed overall. Again, we are not going to initialize this value. We'll initialize it later. As a rule, we declare global variables at the top of the program to make it easier for other programmers to find them and understand your code. Next, we're going to create a function that allows us to fire our energy bolt from our spaceship. 
So let's go down to the bottom of our code. We're going to create a new function, and we're going to call it function fire. First thing we have to check is if the gun is loaded. Because if it's not loaded, we're not going to allow it to fire. So we'll say if gun loaded. This is equivalent to writing gun loaded double equals true. However, with Boolean values, it's usually easier just to write it like this. We'll create a set of curly brackets, and the code inside the curly brackets will execute it if the gun is loaded. First thing we do is set gun loaded equal to false, because if we just fired it, it's no longer loaded. We have to find the ship's current location so we can move the energy bolt there. So we'll say ver ship x equals get x position. And then we want the x position of the ship. And we're going to create another local variable, ship y. We'll set that equal to get y position. Again, the ID of the ship, which is image underscore ship. Now we have to figure out the ship's height and width because we want to make sure it's in front of the ship. So the X and Y position are only going to give us the values of this corner here. So we got to move it over here and we got to know the width for that. And we need to move it halfway down so we got to know the height so it looks like it comes right out of the nose of the ship. So we'll say there ship height equals get property. We want to get the property of the ship, and the property we want to get is the height. Next, we want to get the width, so we'll say ver ship width equals get property, again, from the ship. So we'll put the ship's ID. In this case, we want the width property. Now we have to figure out what the size of the energy bolt is so that we can make sure we calculate it so it comes right out of the center. So we're going to say ver energy bolt height equals get property image underscore energy and we want the height. Now we've got to calculate where we want the energy bolt to go. So we're going to say ver energy bolt x, and that'll be ship x plus ship width, which is going to calculate the ship x there, and then the width is going to add on there, so we'll actually have the x value of right about there, which is where we want it. Now we'll have to calculate the y value we want to put it at, so y energy bolt y equals ship y plus ship height divided by 2 and then minus energy bolt height divided by 2. And this is going to get it just right in front of the nose. Finally, we've got these values calculated, so we've got to move the energy bolt to the calculated position. So we'll say set position image energy, and we want to move it to the calculated x position. So that's energy bolt x, and then move it also to the calculated y position, which is energy bolt y. So now what we have to do is we have to create a command to call fire every time we press enter. So we're going to go back up to our button down event listener. And right here we're going to say if event.key equals enter. Create our curly brackets. And we are going to call the function fire. So let's run this and see if it works. It's not going to be very impressive yet because it's just going to move the energy bolt right in front of the ship. We'll reset it and run it again. Let's move the ship. We hit enter and then it goes right to the nose of the ship. Later on we'll learn how to actually make it move 
so that we can get it out of the screen and then reload it. Our next step is to create an event listener for the start button and what that'll do is it'll put a few things in their proper places then it'll start a timed loop that will eventually be used to move things across the screen and check for collisions. So the easiest way to create an event listener for the button is to go to design, click on start, go to events, and click on under click insert and show code. So down here at the bottom we have our event listener for when the button is clicked. We're going to get rid of this line that was automatically generated. It just outputs button start clicked to the console. Now we're going to create an if statement that checks if the game is already started. Because we don't want to start the game more than once. We're going to say if, we're going to say not, and we're going to check the variable game started. So if the game has not started, we're going to do everything that's in these two curly brackets. The first thing we want to do is we want to set game started to true, because the game has started now. Next thing we want to do is we want to move the start button off the screen so it's not in the way. So we're going to say set position. Then the ID of the button is button underscore start. We'll set it to an X position of 100 and then to a Y position of 500. So it's going to be off the bottom of the screen where we can't see it. Next, we're going to initialize the global variable start time. So we're going to say start time equals get time. Now get time returns what's called Unix time, which is the number of milliseconds since January 1st, 1970. And that number is always increasing as we move on into the future. Now we're going to create a timed loop that's going to run over and over again. So we're going to go to controls. We're going to scroll down until we see timed loop. We're going to drag it over to the bottom of this if statement. Now right now this timed loop is defaulted to run once every thousand milliseconds or once every second. We want to have it run more frequently than that so it's not choppy. So we're going to have it run once every 50 milliseconds or 20 times per second. We've got an anonymous function here so everything in the anonymous function will run 20 times per second. We aren't going to do anything with this now, but we're going to come back to this a little later once we have some other functions to call. Now we're going to work on creating a timer for this program. So we have to have a label up here that's going to display the time. So we're going to go to design. We're going to drag a label up into the upper left hand corner. We want to make sure it's wide enough so it can display the time. We're going to click and drag this out, and we're going to click on it again. We're going to go to Properties. We're going to call it Label underscore Time. The text, we're just going to set at 0, 0.0 to start out with. Now we're going to go write the code to control the label. So we're going to go back to Code. We're going to go to the bottom of our code here, and we're going to create a function called Update Time. So the first thing we need to do is we need to create a variable that's going to store the current Unix time. So we're going to say var current time, and we're going to set it equal to get time, which is going to give us the number of milliseconds since January 1st, 1970, right at this moment. So now we've got to calculate the elapsed time. Elapsed time is a global variable, so we're just going to set it. Elapsed time equals current time minus start time. Now we need to convert it to seconds because it's in milliseconds right now. So we're going to do that by saying elapsed time equals elapsed time divided by a thousand because there's a thousand milliseconds in a second. As it is, we're going to have three digits past the decimal point. For this game, we only want it to one digit past the decimal point. So we'll convert it to tenths of a second precision. So we'll say two fixed, and then we want one digit of precision past the decimal point. Finally, we have to set the value of elapsed time to that label there. So we're going to say set number, and we're going to say label underscore time, and we want to pass it 
elapsed time. So anytime this function is called, it's going to calculate the difference between now and the original time and send that value to that label. So we got to make sure we call update time. So we're going to call it from the timed loop. So we're going to say update time. And every time this time loop runs, update time will be called. So let's try it and see if this works. We're going to reset it, run it, hit start, and there we go. It's calculating the time. And we're eventually going to make this stop once we've killed all our enemies. The next block of code we're going to write is going to handle the energy bolt. So we're going to make it always moving to the right, and we're going to make it disappear when the game starts. So let's go down to the bottom. So let's start a new block of code. We'll call it function move energy bolt. We'll have our curly brackets. We're going to first get the energy bolt's current location. So we're going to make a local variable energy bolt x and we're going to get the x position of image energy. We're going to do the same thing with the y position ver energy bolt y equals get y position image underscore energy. Now we have to create a local variable that's going to control the speed of the energy bolt. So we'll say ver energy bolt speed. Now if you want you could set this to a constant value like 20. I like to make it speed up as it moves to the right. So what I do is I say energy bolt x divided by 10. That way as the x value gets higher the energy bolt is actually speeding up. And you can tweak this however you want. Now we're going to calculate the updated location of the energy bolt. So we're going to say energy bolt x equals energy bolt x plus energy bolt speed. Now we're going to move the energy bolt to the new location. So we're going to say set position. We want to set the position of image energy. And we want to set it to the new energy bolt x and the energy bolt y will be unchanged. Now we have to figure out how to reload it. Now we don't want it to be accessible again too quickly otherwise it makes the game too easy because you can rapid fire. So I usually wait until it's quite a bit past the edge of the screen. The edge of the screen is x of 320. I usually wait till it gets till about 800 which would be about here. You can't see it there but the program's still keeping track. And that gives us a little delay before we can fire again. So I'm going to say if energy bolt x is greater than 800 then we're going to change gun loaded equal to true. Now if you want there to be a longer delay, you can set this higher. If you want there to be a shorter delay, you can set it lower. Also bear in mind the faster the energy bolt is moving, the quicker it's going to get to this location. Now we're going to go back up to our event listener for button start. Once the game is started, we want to move the energy bolt off the screen so we can't see it. So right down here we're going to say set position image energy and then we're going to move it to an x of 400 and a y of 100. So it'll be off the screen where we can't see it. We'll add a semicolon at the end of this line. Now we're going to call our new move energy bolt function from inside the timed loop. So we're going to go inside the timed loop. We're going to say move energy bolt and then every 50 milliseconds it's going to run move energy bolt which is going to advance the energy bolt a little bit to the right. Now we're going to try it out to see it working. So we'll reset and run our program again. We're going to hit start. So the first thing it did was move the energy bolt off the screen here. It's actually continuing to advance the energy bolt along the x-axis where we can't see it. I'm going to hit enter. It fires the energy bolt. Once it gets far enough along the x-axis it's going to be reloadable so we can hit enter again and it'll fire again. If I hit enter too often, it's not going to actually fire it until it gets farther enough along the x-axis. 
Now what we're going to do is we're going to write a function to move the enemies around. And they're going to move down, and then they're going to move to the left and right, so they kind of dodge. Let's go back to full screen mode. Let's go down to the bottom. And we're going to create a function called move enemy. And then we'll have a parameter name because there's different enemies and we'll pass the ID to this parameter when we call move enemy. Okay, so we need to get the enemy X and Y value. So that'll be the upper left hand corner. So we're going to create a local variable enemy X. We'll set it equal to get X position and we'll get the X position of whatever ID is in the name parameter. Then we'll make a local variable enemy Y and set it equal to get y position of whatever ID is in the name parameter. Now we got to decide how far to the left and how far to the right we want the enemies to be swinging back and forth. So we're going to say var min x and I want it to go about to here so that x is let's say about 103. It may be different on yours. I don't want it actually hitting my player's ship. We'll say 103, then we're going to say var max x equals, so let's see, we don't want these ships going off the screen, so we'll maybe set the max to 280, so it'll only swing back that far. Now we're going to calculate the distance from the max, and that's going to help us determine the speed, because we're going to have them speed up and slow down depending on how far they are from the max. So we're going to say var distance from max equals max x minus enemy x. And remember, enemy x is whatever the current x value is of the enemy. Now we're going to create a variable for the vertical speed. So we're going to say var vertical speed. If you would prefer to set it to a constant value, you can. I find it's harder if they change how fast they're moving vertically down. So I base that on how far over to the left they are. So I say vertical speed is equal to distance from max divided by 10. And then I add on 20. And you can tweak this however you want. Then we calculate the horizontal speed. And I have them speed up horizontally, and horizontally is left and right, depending on how long the program's been running. So I set it to var horizontal speed. Now if you want to set this to a constant value, you can. What I do is I have it speed up until it hits a certain time, and then it doesn't go any faster, because otherwise it could get going too fast. So I'm going to use a function called math.min. So I'm going to put in two values in here, and it's going to choose whichever is the smallest one. So I'm going to say either elapsed time divided by 2 or 15. So it's going to speed up until elapsed time divided by 2 equals 15, and then it's just going to go to 15 because 15 will be the smallest. Now we're going to update the Y location. So we're going to say enemy Y equals enemy Y plus vertical speed. Now horizontal is a little bit more difficult because it can either be moving to the left or right. So we've got to switch it up depending on whether it hits our boundaries. So we're going to say if enemy x, and that's the current enemy x location, is greater than max x, then we want to set enemies moving left to true. Because that means if we've hit too far to the right, we want to start it moving left. You may notice that I'm not using curly brackets after this if. If you only have one line of code to be part of an if, an else if, an else, a for, or a while, you don't need to use curly brackets, you can just indent it. If you have more than one line of code that you want to be part of it, you must use curly brackets. Now on the other hand, if enemy x is less than min x, that means we've moved too far to the left, so we want to set enemies moving left to false, so we can have them move right. Now we're going to check, is enemies moving left 
true or false if enemies moving left is true. We remember just saying enemies moving left, or if there's a Boolean value in there, is the same as saying enemies moving left double equals true. It's just a shorter way to write it. We will say enemy x equals enemy x minus horizontal speed. And on the other hand, if enemies moving less left is not true, we're going to say else. We'll say enemy x equals enemy x plus horizontal speed. So now we've got the new x value and the new y value calculated, so we need to move them to those new locations. So we'll say set position, whatever id is in the name parameter, and we're going to set that to the new enemy x and the new enemy y. The final thing we want to do is we want to make it called a vertical wraparound. That way if our enemy hits the bottom, they come back around on the top. So we're going to call vertical wrap around. And we're going to pass it whatever ID is in the name parameter. So now we just got to call function move enemy from our timed loop. So every time the timed loop runs, it'll move each of the enemy. So we're going to go up. We're going to say move enemy. We'll start off by sending it the ID for image underscore enemy underscore one. Put a semicolon there. Then we're going to copy and then paste this three times. And we're going to change this to two, three, four. So it'll update the enemy's location every 50 milliseconds. Let's run it and see it working. So we're going to hit run. We're going to hit start. So the enemies are moving. Now they hit the edge, so they switch directions. They keep moving, and they keep going back and forth. Next, we're going to create a function that detects collisions between the energy bolt and each of the enemies, and then handles those collisions. In this video, I'm just going to explain the basics of the math and logic, but for a more detailed explanation, please click on the link to the video in the upper right-hand corner of this screen. So we're going to create a new function called collision detection, and it's going to have a parameter called object that's going to have the ID of each of these four enemies. So let's put in our curly brackets. We're going to start by getting the location of the energy bolt, which is going to give us a location in the upper left-hand corner. So we'll say var energy bolt x equals get x position, then image energy. Then we'll do the same thing, var energy bolt y equals get y position image underscore energy. Now what we need to do is we need to get the x and y value of whatever object we're dealing with. So the id for the object will be inside the object parameter. So we'll say var object x equals get x position object then var object y equals get y position object. Now we actually need to know more than just the x and y value of the upper left hand corner because we need to know if they're colliding overall. So we need to be able to calculate this corner, this corner, and this corner. So we can do that. We can calculate this lower left hand corner by knowing the upper left hand x y value and knowing the height. And we can calculate this one by knowing the upper left hand coordinates and the width. And we can calculate this one by knowing the upper left hand coordinates and the width and the height. Then we're going to do the same thing with each of these enemy objects so we can tell are they colliding on top of each other. Now we need to calculate the width and the height. So we're going to say var energy bolt width equals get property. I want the property of the image underscore energy. And the property we want is the width. Then var energy bolt height 
equals get property image energy and then height. Let's close this out so we have a little more room to see our code. We can always open the toolbox again if we need to. Now let's get the width and the height of whatever object's ID is in the parameter object. So we'll say var object width equals get property object. We don't have quotation marks around the object because we're not getting the property of something called object. We're getting the property of something that is stored inside the variable object. So we want the width, then var object height equals get property object, and then height. Now what we need to do is we need to see are they overlapping on the X and then we'll check to see if they're overlapping on the Y. So we're going to say if energy bolt X plus energy bolt width is greater than or equal to object x and so we have double ampersands for and energy bolt x is less than or equal to object x plus object width so that means they're colliding on the x-axis now we're going to make a nested if that's going to check if they're colliding on the y-axis so we'll say if energy bolt y plus energy bolt height is greater than or equal to object y and the double ampersands again, those are right over the 7 key, energy bolt bolt y is less than or equal to object y plus object height. So if both of these if statements are true, that means it's colliding on the x-axis, colliding on the y-axis. So the energy bolt is overlapping whichever of these enemy ships that has an ID inside the object parameter. So what do we want to do? We want to first check if it's already hidden, because we're going to hide it once it's destroyed, and we don't want to double count it if it's already been hidden. So we'll say if not, and remember not, which is an exclamation point, always reverses a Boolean value. Makes true, false, and false true. So we want to say get property object, and we want to see if it's hidden. So if it is not hidden, it's going to return false, and this is going to reverse that to true. And if it's not hidden, that means we can destroy it. So the first thing we want to do if we're destroying it is we want to hide it. So we're going to say hide element object. And then we're going to decrease by one the global variable enemies remaining because we have one less enemy to destroy. So we'll say enemies remaining minus minus. Now that's shorthand for enemies remaining equals enemies remaining minus one. It just takes one off the current value and sets it as a new value. By the way, these two slashes tell the computer to ignore everything after them on this line. So we use this to put comments in, notes to other programmers, notes to ourselves. So we've destroyed the enemy. Now we've got to see if there's any more enemies that need to be destroyed. If there isn't, we're going to end the game. So we'll say if enemies remaining is less than or equal to zero. And if it is, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to stop our timed loop. And most importantly, that's going to stop the timer from running. And we're going to hide our energy bolt. So we'll say hide element image energy 
Now, this isn't going to run automatically. We're going to need to call it from the timed loop. So we're going to scroll up. And we're going to say collision detection. And we want to pass it the first ID of the first ob enemy object. And we're going to copy and paste this three times. Four, three. Okay, so now it'll call it for each of them. It'll check if the energy bolt is colliding. If it is, it'll destroy that ship. And it will decrease the value in the enemy's remaining variable by one. Let's play this and see how it works. Moving my character down and up. I'm going to hit enter to fire. Or I hit one. Hit another. Miss that one. Usually the fewer there are, the harder it is to hit them. They're also kind of speeding up now. All right, and I got those last two with one shot. So now I did it in 18.6 seconds. Now I'm going to make a little tweak to make it a little more difficult. I'm going to go to design. I'm going to click on this one. I'm going to make it a little smaller. So I'm going to make my width 25. I'm going to make my height 35. And we can see there's not really a problem with white border. You always got to double check. Make sure there's not a white border outside of the image. I'm going to do that with these ones too. 25 and 35. 25. And 35, you all are probably going to end up using different images, so you're going to have to tweak these numbers a little differently. And I'm going to go back to my code. And then I'm going to speed up my enemies just a little bit. You can do whatever you want. So I'm going to go to my move enemy. And instead of dividing... Uh, my vertical speed distance from max divided by 10. I'm going to divide it by 9. And my horizontal speed, I'm going to let it go as high as 16 instead of 15. So now my enemies will move a little faster. So you can tweak these speeds however you want. You can ha change how much the enemies move in and out by changing the min x and max x. So once you've got yours completed and you want to share it, you can click on the share. And you can copy and paste this. If you'd like to copy and paste it in the comments so other people can see. I also have some other videos on some other programs in App Lab and other languages. You can find the links here or on my channel. Have a great day.